Hey everyone, welcome to another full hour of Q&A. My name is Andrew Krauss, I'm a co-founder of EventRice. 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 Okay, is that better, guys? Can you, um, guys, can you type into me to tell me if that's better? If you guys can hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, no. Testing, one, two. Okay. That's just weird. Okay, you guys can hear me okay? All right, great. Um, let me put this headset aside because it's doing something weird. Be right back, guys. All right, there, that was distracting. All right, everybody says they can hear me, so I guess we can do a whole hour of Q&A. Fantastic, guys. Um, so my name's Andrew Krause. Hmm, getting, hold on, let me, let me put, I can hear the speaker over here, hold on a second. I swear YouTube is so weird with how the interface works when you do a live stream, but I fixed that. It was streaming back on my headset. It's just weird, but it, we're all good now. So um, I co-founded EventRite with Stephen Key over 20 years ago. we have been coaching inventory inventors for the last 20 years. That's what I've been doing for 20 years uh, to license products. And um, we have students licensing products every week. Um, this is, I don't know, the 10th or 11th, maybe 10th, I'm not sure. Madeline's not going to be in the night, um, so she normally helps me out with the questions. So when, if I don't answer your question, it's because I didn't answer it, not because Madeline didn't copy and paste it into Skype for me um, like she's been doing. I'm not going to be able to get everybody's question, but I'll get to as many as I can. Um, so let's just get going, guys, here. Um, so welcome. we got so many people here. I'll just welcome a few people that... Join in early, Pablo, Underdog, Karen, Reality D, Sherry C, Jeff, Country Boy, Fred, Laura, Christopher, Judah. You guys don't want me to rattle off names. You guys want answers to your questions, right? So I'm going to stop that. Um, so let's do the first question here. Jeff says, hey, Andrew, is inventing for the packaging industry all about design? And by the way, if I don't, I'll page down every once in a while just to make sure. Okay, so make sure the audio is good because I don't have a moderator helping me tonight. Um, Jeff says, is inventing for the packaging industry all about design? No, I, I wouldn't say it is. I would say, if you're in, first of all, inventing for the packaging industry. So the packaging industry, probably some of you are like, what, are they, what is he talking about? Um, like a toothpaste tube or um, the, product, the product that other products go in. And obviously, with a packaging product, you know, most of them, you're selling bazillions of units. You're selling huge numbers of units. So, Jeff, I would say it's definitely not all about design. It's the most important thing when you're doing a packaging product is cost. So, oh, my idea is great. Well, if that new toothpaste tube is 10 cents more expensive, you might be toast because now they can't be Aquafresh, can't be competitive with Crest. It's a cool feature, but are people willing to pay an extra 10 cents for that feature? And a lot of times not. So sometimes a half a cent is too much on a packaging product if it increases the price. Other times it could tolerate five or 10 cents. So it really depends on the product. But the most important thing with a packaging product is um, the cost. And then can it be made? And so do they need all this new machinery to make this thing? Or can it be made with existing machines? So just saying it's cool is one thing, but can it fly off the line at a thousand a second? So packaging products are very, very difficult. Um, you know, when I have a, a potential student and I'm talking to them and they're they're rattling off a few products and they got a packaging product and they have other other products, I, I try to direct them to those other products. And I just very honest with them that packaging is very difficult. Now, 
If you can license a packaging product, it's insane money. So that's why a lot of people like it. But you need to get way more into keeping the cost down and understand the manufacturing and then the intellectual property, the patentability around that. So our students do deals all the time that companies don't care about patents. Other times, ah, oh, yeah, we'll file it just so we can say patent pending. And then there's some companies that care tremendously. So the packaging industry would be an industry where they care tremendously about patents. So in, in almost every aspect, Jeff, packaging is more difficult than other than a gardening product or a kitchen gadget or an automotive product or any other category. It's a very difficult one. But no, it's not all about design. Design can be very important, though, of course. So um, let's see, Country Boy says, what's up, my fellow inventors? What's up, Country Boy? Um, let's see. I like Fred was typing in. We have four minutes left. Four minutes left. Like, and you're on the clock. You better show up on time. <laughs> Answer our questions. Um, no, it's cool. just, just kidding, Fred. Um, another question about packaging from a different product. Laura says, along the lines of packaging, is it appropriate to submit an idea to a company that that the company is simply it's simply a new way of packaging their current product, a consumable product? Well, I think with and this will apply to any of your guys' ideas. Yes, you can come up with an idea that is for one company, but what if they're not interested? Are you going to work on the marketing materials and you're going to work on, you know, filing a provisional patent? And yeah, if you're using like our software, you can file a provisional, just pay the 70 bucks to the patent office. You don't have to spend a ton of money with a patent attorney. But if, if you do, if you have to do that, sell sheet, provisional, research, you got one company and they're like, nah, and you're like, oh. I guess that's done. You know, so when you have an idea for one company, what I want you guys to do is always go, are there others? Would this be great for this company? But might it also be great for 20 others? And that will make the project a lot more attractive to work on. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think it's very smart to be working exclusively on licensing one product to one company all the time. Now, with that said, you're paying very close attention to what they need. You believe what they need would be very beneficial to them. I'm not saying that's a bad thing to do, but it could be over very quick. You do all this work and then the whole thing's over. You're putting all your eggs in one basket. So can you put that same egg in somebody else's basket, another manufacturer's basket, another brand? Um, so yeah, uh, but let me answer that more specifically. Let's see. That was from Laura. Simply submitting a new way to package their current product. You know, it has to have some, again, Laura, what you're doing there is what I just talked about with to Jeff is packaging is very difficult. So, you know, if you have to do tons of um, research to figure out how this thing's going to be made and can it be made at a reasonable price, there's just a ton of manufacturing research you have to do with a lot of other products you don't. Um, so to do now, and if your idea is just, Oh, you should put it in a box instead of in a blister pack. That's not an idea. So without understanding your idea and talking about your idea, I can't give you a specific answer. At least I gave you a general answer that benefited you and everybody else. Um, Karen, uh, hi, Andrew. When creating a sell sheet, if you know a specific licensee has an existing product which they're likely to compare your product to, would you tackle this head on and say why yours is better? Um, yeah, you know, it, it doesn't come across very good to say, well, I know that product you have everywhere. It sucks. Mine's better. You know, um, that's not a really smart thing to do. So they're going to know, they know their product. You know, the benefit of yours, just show them your sell sheet. They'll be like, Ooh, this could improve our sales. We could add these features that you're showing. And, but again, um, you, there's going to be other companies that aren't making quite that same thing and they're great potential licensees as well. Sometimes it's a company that's in that space and they can make your product. They see others are making it. They haven't gotten into it yet. And that might be a little bit better to license to than the company that you're saying your product sucks and my product's going to replace your product. Um, would I still approach them? Sure, I would. Sure. But you don't say that. 
you know, yeah, I don't think you were saying, Kieran, that um, ours has several additional benefits, some of which wouldn't normally go into the cell sheet, cheaper to manufacture, consumables, less resources. So when you have additional things, the cell sheet or your video, when you show it to the company, it should be their advertisement to their customer. Don't put in there that it's cheaper to manufacture or less resources. Consumers could care less about that. Right. So that's something that could go in your cover letter, which is your email these days. So send the email, you put it in there and then you attach the sell sheet. That is the advertisement for their customer. Don't put stuff in there. Well, everybody wants it. Um, you know, it's going to cheap you man, stuff about manufacturing or those details. Uh, think of what a consumer would want to see, what their customer would want to see. That's what you put in there. Anything else you can put in the cover letter if you think it's intriguing. Um, but don't throw everything in the kitchen sink in there. If you know that a company is going to see your cell sheet and have some sort of objection, like people are going to look at it, oh, it's going to be too expensive. And you think like you do a preemptive strike and you put it in the email when you send it and say, I know it might look expensive, but I've really gotten the cost down or whatever. You know, give them a reason to want to call you. Um, you don't want to do a lot of that, but when it's appropriate, you can, you can do that. It's, I, I find that, our students have a hard, it's, it's, it's quite often our students when they say, oh, this is what I should write, or they send it to the coach, the coach is like, uh, that could be a little bit, a little bit better, you know? Um, so it, 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 people, people quite often don't put, use the right words. Let's just say that. <laughs> and we get people tweaked in there. Um, I'll, uh, well, I answered that one. I'll, maybe I'll come back to that one, Kieran, because you got a ton of them here. I want to get some other people here so it's spread out. Um, Anthony says, can I license a product with no protection or PPA? Yes, many of our students have done that. Um, now, we were talking about the packaging industry. No, they're obsessed about patents, not there. Got a gift product, some kitchen gadgets. Some companies just don't care. So the companies will range from we could care less we're going to pay you regardless. Um, if you want to file it, go ahead, but we don't care. Like I had, I remember this one company said to one of our students, the student was very knowledgeable and educated because he'd been with us for a while. And they, he, they got really far along and they just never brought up patents. It was never discussed. And the inventor said, our students said, do you want to file a patent on this? And they said, they literally said this, and I don't, it's rare that a company would say this, but they said, oh, we, we don't care about patents. We'll just crush the competition. I love this. This is classic. We'll just crush the competition with our distribution. So they happen to be the company who is licensing to the biggest guy on the block. They could care less. They're like, why do we need that? We'll just reduce the price. We'll get, well, we have great distribution. Now, not all companies feel that way. That's extreme. Now, the other extreme is we... We won't do a deal with you, not only if you don't get a patent, but if you don't get these claims. Again, that's really extreme. Most, a lot of companies are somewhere in between where they're like, ah, yeah, you know, okay, we'll give you an advance on royalties so you can pay for the patent, pay for the patent. And um, yeah, we'd like to be able to say patent pending, yeah. You know, it's like somewhere in between. Um, but some industries like gift and novelty, they don't mostly care at all about patents. They'll, they'll might look at you funny if you're like, are you going to file a patent on this? They're like, why would I do that? Um, so yeah, you can do licensing deals all the time, Anthony, without, without patents. Now, not every company will be okay with that. And in some industries, they, they want patents more than others. You know, like you're doing a, a medical device. They, they're pretty patent obsessed. Kitchen gadgets, somewhere in between to not caring that much. Um, so it's, 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 it's all over the, the board. Um, let's see. So many questions here. Uh, Reckless. I have a revolutionary movie concept. Is it possible to license this idea to someone such as Warner Brothers, filmmakers, without having it taken away it, uh, since there would be no prototype? So um, Hollywood is Hollywood, guys. It's not, uh, it's not, it's not real. And it's not licensing like we do. Um, 
holly, you know, licensing consumer products, industrial products, even services in some cases to companies is very different. It's a whole nother ball game to pitch scripts for movies. The type of licensing we teach does not apply. Now, a sell sheet, um, video sell sheet, being brief to the point, some of the stuff we teach applies there. But Reckless, if that's what you want to do, we're not you guys. You need to get that advice somewhere else. Steve and I have been candidates for many, many TV shows over the years. The Hollywood people are very flaky. Um, and we don't even get excited when people contact us again because we realize it's so likely something will happen there. Um, uh, but, yeah, so I can't comment on that. You need to find somebody an expert in pitching Hollywood. That's a different kind of licensing. But it is licensing. It is. But that, that's one of those areas that we wouldn't be covering with what we do. Um, uh, Lindsay says, how do we find companies that are looking for medical related COVID ideas that can be licensed? Well, just like you always do, you, you go where you think those products would sell and you look at other companies making products in that space and that's your list of potential licensees. So, you know, if you think you people would buy those products at a Walgreens, well, that's just an example. Then you look at other people selling somewhat medical products at Walgreens and you make a large list of retailers. And then you hit up companies that are in those retailers. The best litmus test is to, if a company is worth contacting is the fact that they're in a retailer you want to be. And that could mean for industrial distribution channels or consumer or anywhere else. That's the litmus test. You're not going on Alibaba and going, who could make my face mask? Because those just, they just, when you license, you're licensing to somebody that has distribution and sales and marketing, not somebody that can just make it, not a contract manufacturer. Um, okay, Adam says, hi, Andrew. Besides the boot camp that InventRight does, and, uh, and does they, do they offer a negotiating service strictly for negotiating? Um, to do a potential licensing deal. Um, we work very affordably, guys. So when we, when somebody has already got a deal on the table, we just sign them up for the boot camp and say, we'll help them for six months. It's going to be more affordable for you that, that way anyway. But here's, here's the thing I've noticed over the years. We have fans of the YouTube show, fans of our book, and they, sometimes we talk to them about the boot camp, uh, and, they're, and they're trying to save money, and I get that. I mean, I'm, I like to save money too. And they say, well, I'll, I'll, I'll sign up when I get into a negotiation and I, I never see them come back because I know they would reach out to me if they got into a negotiation. The vast majority of them don't come back because they're something about their product didn't make sense. They didn't do their research, right? Their sell sheet sucks. They're not approaching companies, right? They don't get the deals on the table because they're not doing things right. But Adam, if you want to try that and you want to reach out and try to get a hold of companies and you have a deal on the table, then you can just join using the boot camp, and then we'll just jump on and help you at that level. And you'll be getting even more higher level help. So that's the way we would help you. But um, I think a lot of people are fans of ours. And think, well, I'll just jump on when I get into a deal. But they're not pushing hard enough. The things they're doing aren't right. They're not communicating properly. They think what they're doing is right, but it's not. I would say 95% of this, I think I've said this before in these Q&As, 95% of our students that when they come to us, if they've already got a marking piece done, it's not good enough. It's not. So it's really common for, but I've seen some people that just fans of ours and I'm like, whoa, that's a really cool sell sheet. That's nice. You know, so I do see some people, but most of the time your marketing sucks. Your list of companies is anemic and you haven't thought about all the things you need to think about. Um, and there's just a lot of missing pieces. Um, so, but, and then also I think the problem with people like I got a deal on the table. What I do is I don't try to sign them up for the boot camp. I talk to them about the deal and go, this isn't really a deal. They think it's a deal. I, I get people, this is kind of, you're going to laugh, but I get people that they, the company, somebody in the company just agreed. They didn't even send it to them yet. And they just agreed to receive it and they think they're in a deal. You know, so um, I, I don't want somebody to sign up thinking they're in a deal and then a week later they realize they're not 
and then have signed up for the six month boot camp. So I always talk to people to make sure if it's really a, a deal or not. And, you know, it's a lot of back and forth, too. So deals fall out all the time. Our students get initial interest. I wouldn't say deals. It's like, to me, you're in a negotiation as soon as the second they show interest. But people are at various stages of interest all the time. Getting initial interest for one of our students to reach out to 30 companies, and it's, it's all over the map, guys, so I'm not saying this is a rule, and get interest from five companies, that's normal. For them to reach out and only get interest from one company, that's normal. For them to reach out and not get any traction at all, that's normal as well. It's all normal. And then you got to look at what you're doing and then rework it, maybe go back. And it's different for, for everybody. Um, uh, Lindsay said, uh, well, I already answered one of yours, Lindsay, so I'll jump back to that. I want to be fair and get to everybody's a little bit. Um, Okay, Mark says, hey, Andrew, I have a patent pending promotional product that is travel related. I have a CEO that is interested in it, but it seems to be dragging his feet. Yeah, they suck. CEOs suck. Unless it's a small company. <laughs> they don't do work. Um, I have been working with him since August of 2019. Something's really wrong there, Mark. You know, the, the biggest thing that's probably wrong there is you're thinking that he's in charge of moving this forward and he's not. The companies are not in charge of moving this forward, you are. Um, if, if, every, if every time one of our students got interest, we said, oh, go to a licensing attorney, they would kill 80% of the deals. But, uh, but also another thing I'll say is, you're way more responsible for moving it forward than they are. If you just go, oh, tell me what to do, and you're just like a deer caught in the headlights, deals will fizzle out every time, and that's what's happening with you, Mark. You need to guide them more than they guide you. Now you're like, oh, they're a big company, Andrew. I'm just an individual inventor. I'm not going to tell them what to do. No, you're not being bossy and telling them what to do, but they'll ask for things that if you understand the process, you know are productive, so you redirect the conversation. Maybe you half answer it. Maybe they get really focused on you need to answer it but you redirect the conversation to where you need to go. If you don't know how to direct the conversation more than they are most, I mean, if they're directing it, great, you know it's going the right direction, go with it. But if you see it's not going the right direction, you need to do that. And it's simple emails and appropriate phone conversations at the right time. So August of 2019, that's dragging way too long. If it's a small company, it might be appropriate for you to be talking to the CEO. If it's a company of any decent size, you're talking to the wrong person. And you need to ask them, like, who, who are we working with within this company? You know, um, and the reason why it's dragging is because you're with the CEO, because CEOs don't do the work. They make big picture, you know, uh, decisions and things. They don't do the day to day grind stuff. So but without, you know, talking to you, Mark, about all the conversations you have and where you are with it, I can't specifically guide you there. So but what I'll generally say is. Uh, uh, helpful to the entire audience is that you as the inventor are way more responsible for moving a licensing deal forward than they are. They don't go, oh, here's our formal process. We're going to do this and then this and then this. So people get very shocked by that. Um, really, really important. So that that's beneficial to everyone. Um, I like to answer these questions, so I'm not just answering it, the individual's person question, but I'm making it applicable to everybody else as well. Uh, Vito says, how do you trust patent search folks? I'm afraid that some of the simplest ideas can be easily copied. I've never personally never known of a graphic designer that's overseas, a lot of her overseas or a patent searcher or any of these vendors that has stolen an idea from an inventor trying to license their product. Um, you know, even if they loved it, they wouldn't ever, I don't know of a single patent searcher that licenses products. They do patent searches. So I, I don't think they have the skills to steal your idea, even if they wanted to, you know, but my response is if you have somebody doing a patent search veto, have them sign a non-disclosure agreement and the kind of um, supercharged non-disclosure agreement is to have a improvements clause in there that you own this and any improvements. 
And so even if they came up with improvements, it would be yours. So have them sign something. Any patent searcher should be willing to do that, in, in my opinion. Um, most of the time when patent searches are done, you go to an attorney and then the attorney just outsources some patent searcher. And I would think that if it was a legitimate attorney, they wouldn't want that liability that this, they know some patent searcher is looking to steal people's ideas. I, I don't, I think most people, if they had a great idea, they wouldn't know what to do with it. They don't know how to license the product and they don't have the bandwidth to start a, to start a business financially or time-wise or anything else. So I, I, I'm very unconcerned about it. And I just don't see it happening. Could it happen? Has it happened to somebody somewhere? Sure, of course. Um, uh, Amanda, does it take the whole six months to complete the boot camp? I have a great product idea, however, I'm concerned um, that the company may get the jump on me. I don't foresee any workarounds for my product. I, yeah, I don't understand. So, you know, so you're so that the company that that I'm concerned that someone else or a company. So you're concerned you came up with an idea and you think somebody else is going to spontaneously come up with it as well and come up with it in the same time period that you're working on it. Um, and you are worried that you're it's going to that our program is six months. Our program is in six months. It's because that's the time it takes to get you indoctrinated and taking action and giving you real life experience on one or more than one project. So that's the reason for the six months. But Amanda, if you're so worried that, oh, well, I can't be like calling companies like within a week of signing up because somebody else might knock me off. That is just pure inventor paranoia. You need to get rid of that. And our coaches talk to you and, and, help you get rid of that, those sort of worries. Now, we all, I also tell people, you know, file the provisional patent the day or the week before you're ready to start calling. But, you know, provisional is only 70 bucks. So if you're like really paranoid about it, Amanda, you could say, well, you could say to your coach, well, Andrew told me it was okay. And I want to file my PPA first. But, you know, when you file a provisional patent, you should at least, at the very least, have done all your research on all the other products in the space and thought about all the product variations. Um, and include that. So you could file a provisional before doing your sell sheet, making your list, and then reaching out. So if, if spending the 70 bucks gives you the warm and fuzzies to know that you took care of it with a PPA before some other company, well, then do that. I'm all for that. That's fine. But our students always want to do it. No, it's always, but a percentage of students say, well, I'm going to file a PPA first. And we're like, no, that's the last thing you do before you start calling companies. Because in the process of looking at all their products and making your list of companies, you'll find things that might affect what you put in your PPA. You might throw another variation or something in there. So Amanda, you know, it's, I, I can say, you know, get rid of that and paranoia, but that doesn't help you. You know, you just file the provisional patent. You can use our smart IP software to do that. You don't need to go out and spend a ton of money with a patent attorney or anything. And that should take care of your concern. But filing that provisional, if you don't know how to get reach out to companies, don't know how to make a sell sheet, don't know how to make your list of companies, don't feel comfortable reaching out, it does you no good. It's useless. So people file a provisional, get the warm and fuzzies, and they just sit on their hands. So, and, and that's not a big deal. If you guys have done that, you could just file another provisional and get another year. It doesn't continue from the first provisional. They're completely separate. So I'm, I'm fine. it happens all the time. I see all the time. I'm not judging any of you. If you file a provisional, didn't do anything with it. And if you haven't made public disclosure, just file it again and get another a year from the new date that you file it. doesn't continue. They're not connected to each other. And um, let's see. I want to try to get a, a range of folks. Okay, Judah says, what factors do you think give a product idea the best chances for success? What industries, what type of ideas are companies – signing deals with in other words what makes money okay good question fair question um i can give you some criteria it's 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 all over the map so let's talk about with industries um it, it's not really just the industry it's what are they going to do with it so people you know you can license a, a product to a really big company but if their plans for your product are minuscule and small, what's the point, right? 
So it's the, the, the size of the company and what their plans are for it. And I've talked to inventors, not our students and not people who have been watching us for a while, and they signed licensing deals and they literally didn't know where the company distributed. And I'm like, what was going through your head? And then they're wondering why the company's not doing anything with it. It's been sitting there for two years, three years. And, and they didn't put any performance clauses in there. It's like, what were you thinking? So when you, when you do a deal with a company, you need to hold them to it in, in the contract. So Judah, with regards to your question, what industries, you know, I have, I remember I did a student that had this large um, boring drill. It was the size of a car. And then I have other people that did gag novelty gifts, people that did gardening products, people that did aftermarket automotive, kitchen gadgets, um, restaurant, hotel supply products. I mean, just the list goes on and on and on. If they're selling products and you have a new product that you think would fit in with their product line, it, it, you can license it. You know, so, um, but certain industries, so to give you an example, Judah, like, if you're in the novelty gift industry, some of the really, really novel stuff, it'll sell for a season or two. You, you need to talk about what their intention is. They're like, oh yeah, well, we'll sell that for Valentine's Day for one season. It's like, okay, and if your goal is the money, and some people really like novelties, but that's not gonna make you a lot of money as, as opposed to selling a kitchen gadget that they're gonna sell half a million units of. There's a big difference there. So, um, you know, licensing licensing a really niche product doesn't really make any sense. And it's not really that much harder to license to a company that's going to sell 200,000 units for a company that's going to sell 2,000. So when you look at your products, see how niche your product is. Be honest with yourself by looking at the other products and making assumptions about, is this a really niche product or is this a mass consumer product? Also, you know, if, with regards to making money, Judah, you know, there's three factors I always talk about, three. Um, there's the royalty rate. That's the only thing that people look at and that's wrong. So it's the royalty rate and usually it's the, it's the wholesale price. So it's the price they sell to the retailer for because that's easy to track with the books because, you know, everything goes on sale now, right? You can't track that, what it's sold at for retail. So usually the royalties on the wholesale price, the price they sell to the um, retailer for, because that's easy to track from an auditing standpoint. Um, I don't know if we've ever had a student that audited their licensee, I think maybe once or twice in 20 years. But if you need to audit them, that is clear that way. But it's the royalty rate, and then it's the volume being sold, and then the price of the product. So is it a 99-cent product, or is it a, you know, with this boring drill the size of a car, I don't know what that thing costs, maybe $50,000, you know? And then the volume that they could do. So you have to interview these companies and see the volume they can do, and, and then you have to hold them to it in the contract. So I think um, what another thing I, I wouldn't say industry specific, uh, Judah, I would say if you really if your main goal is, is money, I would focus on really simple products that you get a yay or an A from really quick. They look at it. They don't doesn't look like there's any major manufacturing issues. So you can play the numbers game. So you can work on a lot of products. So um, ideally. It would be a product. I mean, but products don't have to be ideal. You guys are excited about your ideas. You know, not every product needs to be a product that sells half a million units, and, you know. So, but ideally it would be a product that's fairly straightforward as far as the benefits. Like, oh, I get this and it makes sense amongst everything else in the marketplace. So when they see the marketing, they get it. Um, no major manufacturing issues. This is the ideal product. Most products are not ideal. No major manufacturing issues. And they're just evaluating it based on the marketing more or less. Oh yeah, we can make that. Um, so those products are great because if you don't have to spend a lot of time prototyping and doing a lot of manufacturing research, what does that mean? That means you can work on more projects and the more projects you work on and the more companies you call per, per project, the more chances for success. If you have a project and you have 30 companies, that's 30 chances for success. If you have three, that's three chances. If you work on eight products a year and each one has 30 potential licensees. Well, then what is that? 240, 240 chances for success. I don't know if I did that right. Um, 
you know, so that's, you know, so really if, if your main motivation, which you're not saying, in other words, what ideas make money? Okay. You are asking basically what ideas make money. So um, if you really want to make a lot of money on this in the long run, you got to play the numbers game. You got to work on a lot of projects and the easiest way to work on more projects is to work on simple projects. Now I have students that have really cool stuff and they're not simple projects, but that's what they wanted to do. Um, Let's see. So the answer to your question, what types of ideas are companies signing deals with? Our students are signing deals with all over the map. Sometimes people think like they look at some of the success stories and they think, oh, it's just like gadgets and gizmos. Um, we have this couple, we can't even mention it because they made the company made them sign an, an NDA and they weren't even supposed to be talking to us. But we guided them through the deal, helped them close the deal kind of sucks that we can't talk about, but they closed the deal with a major automotive manufacturer, which is ex next to impossible to do. We told them that's going to be next to impossible to do. We ended up helping them do that. Um, and that was on a, an automotive product that goes on cars that come off the line. Usually it's a lot easier to license an automotive aftermarket product because you've got a bunch of companies. Um, but, you know, we have, we have people that are doing boring drills and then we have, um, you know, business to business products and consumer products of all different types. So if it's a product that it's sold, most of the time it can be licensed. Um, you know, and, and uh, you, another thing that I'll say if your main goal, uh, Judah, is to make money is if you're playing the numbers game, more products, more companies per product, and staying in an industry is always beneficial. So let's say you do a gardening product and you love gardening, and when you get it in there to 30 companies and 28 say no, those 28 were not a waste of your time. You use that first product to establish the relationship and you ask them, are you open to more ideas? And almost all of them, if they receive the first one, they'll say yes. And then you're right back in there with the next one. So you have to lay the groundwork to make the relationships with your first product. And then you can focus more on just coming up with ideas because you got those relationships. But you should always be pushing out making those new relationships. So another thing that I will say if you're focused really on making money, Judah, is um, to stay in an industry. You know, you might be like, oh, I'm in garden and kitchen or whatever you like um, because you're going to utilize those same ones you approached again and again. Um, and that's going to, again, reduce your time involvement and increase your chances for success. So I ran a long time on that one. Um, Uh, call, call Khalid, I think I did that. I'm sorry if I pronounced it wrong. Is, if FDA approval an important thing, is it important? How can I deal with a company that wants FDA approval for my product idea? Is there a way that they can make the FDA by themselves after they license the idea? So the FDA is the Food Drug Administration. Most of your products don't require Food and Drug Administration uh, approval. Um, but if it does, you know, the company that is licensing it is in that space. So if let's say it's a medical device, you know, and they know what's required and they're going to be the ones that get FDA approval. I've had some um, students that work on uh, um, medical devices, for example, that require FDA approval. And the company didn't want to move. The excuse they gave was this is going to be too hard to get past the FDA. And that's the reason. It's like, well, if you're really interested in the product, you would have done it because you got it for your other products. So I think sometimes it's an excuse they give, but sometimes they just know how hard it is sometimes with some medical devices, for example. So yeah, that's not something you're going to do, uh, Khalid. That's something they're going to do. So I wouldn't worry about it. If, if a product requires FDA approval, is it harder to license? Yes, it is. Because that's another jump hoop that the company needs to jump through. Even if it's a regular hoop they always jump through, then it's, you know, it's going to be one more thing that makes it harder to, to, to get that deal done. Um, let's see. Oh, well, this is nice. I don't know what their real name is, but it's Blue Raspberries 111. I would agree with what he's saying about the boot camp referring to me. Getting the boot camp was the, was the game changer. My cell sheet was fixed. Uh, my communication improved. 
and my organization, et cetera. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what your name is. I, I, and that wasn't a plant, guys. That looks like a current or former student. So um, thank you for saying that. I feel weird saying these blue raspberries. Okay. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Is there any other color raspberries? There's so many questions in here. I lost track of where it was. Here. Uh, uh, see, Mark says, I've read Stephen's Sell Your Idea with or without a patent book. That's a, a cool book. It's a more advanced book that my business partner, Stephen Key, came out with about intellectual property and patents. I, if you haven't read One Simple Idea or Core Book, um, don't read Sell Your Idea with, your, with or Without a Patents first. Read that after because um, it'll just make things seem more complicated because it's more advanced stuff. But um, And Mark wrote, um, does Smart IP, that's our software that helps you file a provisional patent. It's, only, it's included with our boot camp, but you can buy it for like 99 bucks as well. Um, does it provide additional info of value over what the book instructs? Um, Yes, I think it provides you with a framework. I think if you use that a couple of times, I think it could be helpful to you, Mark. Um, I, I, I definitely think it, it could. Um, it, it, it asks you like what type of pat product you have, sort of method, method, device, and it gives you some templates. And you can kind of use those templates, to be honest with you, in the future, if you kind of save some of those. So I do think it would offer you some value. And the value I'll offer to all of you is the most important thing you can do um, when writing a provisional patent is to get outside of your brain and to think about all the product variations. Most inventors don't do that. The longer you think about your idea, the more fixed it becomes in your brain. And when you don't cover those product variations or your patent attorney doesn't, if you have a patent attorney, that's why, that's why a lot of patents are absolute garbage. The inventor didn't say, oh, here's my widget with all the workarounds, improvements, and changes, you know, possible variations. And patent says, oh, thank you. I'll make sure to include those. Patent, if the inventor doesn't do that. That's on the inventor. That was the inventor's fault. Now, when a patent attorney, this is my opinion, doesn't say to the inventor, look, you need to give me all the workarounds, variations, improvements. Don't just give me this one version. A lot, most patent attorneys don't do that. A lot of them don't. And they suck if they don't. Tell your patent attorney they suck if they didn't do that with you because that they just really missed the mark. So, and, you know, but you don't need to run to a patent attorney. You can use our software to file a, a provisional patent. And, um, but you need to do that when you're writing it on your own. You need to think about the variations. The longer you think about a product, the more fixed it becomes in your head. And you need to knock yourself off when you write your provisional. Come up with that version that's 80% as good, 70% as good, half as good. That's just a waste. You're wasting your time, including that, because it's not competition. Or maybe just as good, but it's a variation. So, and I know in that book, we go into way more depth than just that, Mark, but that's to me the most important thing to do. I think you might see some value in using Smart IP, Mark. Um, I don't know your background, so. Um, uh, Russell says in the previous Zoom meeting, the speaker only wanted, I think Russell's talking about, I just got off another, Steve and I uh, co founded a, not for profit. We don't sell anything at IGA and Meta Groups of America. And we do webinars there as well. And um, and Trish from All Star Marketing at DRTV company was on. So he was on there apparently. In the previous Zoom meeting, the speaker only wanted a video and a short set of bullet points versus a sell sheet. Is the sell sheet still a good idea? Absolutely. Um, so if they're in DRTV, it's TV. So they love videos. So that makes lots of sense. But a lot of times in a sell sheet, a one-page advertisement for your product, you can illustrate it and they get it right away. So there's no need to always do a video, but videos can be very powerful. Now, video it can be a slippery slope because in a video, you can cram more stuff in there. You cram too much stuff in there, you lose your message. You know. So is a sell sheet still a good idea? Yeah, a sell sheet's still a good idea. Um, for Russell, for that one company that said, we like videos, do a video for them. But even a company that is a DRTV infomercial company, they can look at a sell sheet too if it's done well and go, ooh, I see this. I could envision the video. But if it's a DRTV company, don't make them envision it. Just do the video. And it can be very crude. Um, and that's not you talking about, hi, my name is Andrew Krauss, and I invented this. 
I came up with the idea when I was hanging out with my wife, you know, <laughs> you get, it's like an advertisement, right? Um, so Russell, yes, sell sheets are still good. Could you send a sell sheet in addition to a video, which might be your question? Uh, yes, you can still do that. I don't see that would be harmful if that's your question. Um, I'm trying to go through here to pick some people that um, I haven't answered questions. Amanda, do your licensing agreements expire? Um, yes, they do. A lot of times, you know, it'll say that if the company wants to continue and they're meeting the minimum guarantees or whatever are things that will continue on with the same royalty rates under the same terms. Um, so it'll be an automatic renewal as long as they can, can, can comply or it could be negotiable. It still boggles my mind that companies uh, agree to contracts where you would have to be renegotiated a period of time and you have them over the barrel. And we do deals like that where it's giving the inventor the upper hand on the company after a while. Now, you know, if they're doing a great job and all that, you know, why, if it expires after three years, why would you want to put the screws to them? But if they're doing a few things wrong, that's a good time to uh, negotiate those things. Um, so yeah, a lot of times they will renew with the same terms. Um, and if they're meeting those terms, you, you, you're happy with that. And other times there's an opportunity to negotiate. Um, let's see what else we got here. Amanda said, Andrew, you are hilarious. LOL. <laughs> I don't know what I said earlier, but thank you. I don't think I'm being that hilarious, but I'll try to tell more jokes. You know, you got to keep it fun, right? Um, okay, Raul. Hey, Andrew, if a company says they'll reach out to you after six to eight weeks for a review on one submission, is it okay to keep sending more throughout the waiting period? Um, more products. Uh, you know, if you don't know the company yet, um, in most cases, I would just let them respond to that one product before you send them more products. And then once they've responded, then ask for, for permission to send more. I think just blasting them with like six or eight ideas or something, that's not when you, they don't know you yet. Um, but when they reject your first one, if they do, because you know, that's, that's how licensing work, guys. Most companies are going to say no, and you only once say yes. So when they say no to you, which you're going to get tons of no's when you're licensing, say, hey, can I send some more? And would it be okay to send four at a time? You know, what have you, and ask for permission. So if you, if you submitted it to them, you're waiting six to eight weeks to respond, send a bunch more. I, I would say don't do that. Um, you know, keep yourself busy by approaching other companies. And that... You know, and, and that's, when I look at inventors that aren't our students, that's the big mistake. They find two or three and they submit and that's it. Can't do that, guys. You won't be successful that way. You have to, you know, and, you know, some products, you might only have eight companies. You might only have five. You might only have 12. Um, we push our students whenever possible to reach out to 30. Now, if there isn't 30, fine. But sometimes there isn't 30 because you didn't do your research and you didn't understand how to do it. You didn't understand how to find companies. And so when our coaches talk to our students, they say, oh, for your product, I would look over here and I'd look over there and I'd look for people doing this and people doing that. And it's a back and forth between the coach and the student. And they're, they're coming back with it like, uh, like 70% done. Okay, but you still need to do this and this. And the student's like, oh, yeah, you know, you did tell me that, but I, I did see those. I need to add that. So it's a, it's a, it's a learning process. It's a back and forth. Um, that's why we don't do uh, hourly consulting. Consulting to me is a dirty word. Consulting is stringing people out for more billable hours so they're dependent on you. And so I, when I, I'm literally insulted when people call us consultants, and I tell it as a joke of course, but I say, we're your mentor, your coach, your teacher, whatever you want to call us, but don't call us a consultant. And that's the reason why we only do the six months because people are like, oh, but just one more question, just one more question. And I know they're not doing a bunch of things right. So we don't do the hourly consulting thing. I think we'd be doing people a tremendous service and it'd be incredibly expensive too. It's so much cheaper just to go, here's six months of help. We're going to give you that real life experience. So now you can do this the rest of your life. Uh, let's see. Let's find some people we didn't answer a question from. Um, Millie. Uh, hi, Andrew. Love your work. What if your PPA 
What if you have a PPA and make changes to the product? Is it void? How do you account for future variations of the product? So just file another PPA. So your first PPA had A and B in it. And then you're like, oh crap, I, I got this other right, another variation of it. Take that same PPA and, and just add C. And so the first one, you're protected from the first date. The second one, you're protected from the second date. Okay? And that's, that's what I would do. Uh, Todd says, two or three companies interested. When do you tell the companies about other interests and could this help in negotiations? No, it'll hurt you, Todd. You don't, you're honest if they say, were you showing it to anybody? I say, yeah, of course I'm shopping it around. Oh, who? I, I, I can't disclose that. It's confidential. Just like everything you share with me is confidential, everything other companies share with me as well is confidential. Because um, if, you, if you're kissing and telling with them, then they're going to think you're doing the same thing and now you don't have a trusting relationship. Thinking you're going to pit them against each other is, is amateur hour. Don't do that, guys. There are rare instances where you have to let them know when you get to like you've got multiple companies or two at final stages and there's an instance. But we're in licensing deals all the time with our students and it's extremely rare that you would even bring it up. Yes, I'm shopping it around, of course. But to talk about other companies... Not smart, not smart. It's also a great position to be in, but there's a big difference from initial interest, like they drop an email back, and like being in a final contract negotiation. The average time from initial interest to close deal for our students is three months. Could be shorter, could be longer. Yeah, we've had a few brutal ones the last 10 months. What's really cool a lot of people don't know about us is when our students get into a deal and you have a contract, not initial interest because people get that all the time, but when you have a contract or a term sheet with us, um, we will help that student beyond their membership and we won't ask them to renew for that one company with that one deal, but not initial interest. But if you get a contract, we'll help them beyond. We don't ask them to renew. We don't publicize that because people misinterpret that. Then they're going to continue their membership forever. Oh, but I got interest from this one. Oh, I got interest from this one. And that doesn't, that doesn't work. But I think it's really cool and I think it's ethical. It's just the right thing to do to not put the screws to a student and say, oh, well, we can't help you with that negotiation unless you renew. Um, and really, it's in our best interest, too, because we want our students to close deals because that makes us look good. It's like, well, we helped the student through the deal, you know. Um, let's see. Uh, Prime Time says, do, do companies listen to hand-drawn ideas? Well, they couldn't listen to it prime time. They have to look at it, but just a bad joke. But um, I, I, I think it's a bad idea for the most part. I think that if you have a relationship with a company because you've submitted them some products and you're like, hey, you know, I, I'm really good at sketching. Can I just sketch some of these up, write a few bullet points, send you a bunch of ideas at some point? And they're like, oh, yeah, that's cool. And it's in a certain industry. Sure, that's fine. But just to, to send hand-drawn ideas that look really crude, um, especially if you're not good at drawing. You know, this is the best way I can explain it. You want them to see the marketing that they're going to do, you know, and it doesn't need to be perfect or beautiful, but they, so they can envision how they're going to market to their students and how many, uh, to their, to their um, customers, how many times have you seen a hand drawn advertisement? That's not how advertisements work. Um, with our students, we do the graphic design for them. Um, while they're with us, but you know, if you're on your own or you're a former student of ours, you can go out and find graphic designers who work very reasonably these days. There's no excuse for not doing something that looks a little bit more professional. Um, let's see. Okay, Zam says, in packaging, is it better to approach a big player like Walmart who uses the packaging on a large scale, or should I approach the manufacturer of the packaging? Oh, okay, so Zam, I'm assuming you have a packaging product? No, you approach the uh, contract, the packager. So if, they're, if, if you've got a new packaging that products would go in, you would approach the, the contract manufacturers that manufacture packaging for other um, manufacturers. So it gets a little complicated with packaging products. It's not for the faint of heart. Um, but no, you're not approaching Walmart. Walmart doesn't care. No, 
you're approaching the, the, you can approach the company that would end up using it, get their interest, then go to the contract manufacturer that manufactures this sort of packaging, let's say toothpaste tubes or something, you know, certain types of boxes. And you go, hey, this company and this company are one interest. They want this new box innovation. Will you make it? You know, because they want to buy it. So you can do that if your product's a packaging product, if I understood your question right. If not, it was still a good answer. <laughs> um, well, Damali says, what if your company does not like your NDA terms? Well, for the most part, again, everything that we're sharing tonight is not legal advice. Please seek the services of an attorney if you're seeking legal advice. But Damali, my question is, um, and you're not a student of ours, so um, let's Name's very familiar, but um, why are you asking companies to sign your NDA is my question. So our students, for the most part, they file a provisional patent application. They're fine with that. Most companies will not sign your NDA up front because th imagine you're getting 150 products from 150 different inventors. You need to have a full-time attorney to review every NDA to make sure they didn't put something, the inventor didn't put something in there that says you own their company. It's not practical. You've got your provisional patent. Why are you asking all these companies to sign NDAs? You know, now if they sign, ask you to sign theirs, read through it, make sure it's okay. Sometimes they get, they're not cool in there. It's very rare, but you know, it says we'll own your idea or pay you a maximum of $5,000. Well, read through the NDA or non, a lot of them are NCAs, non-confidentiality agreements. But um, you're just going to put this giant brick wall between you and the company if you ask everyone to sign your NDA. You know, and now I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying most of our students don't do it. They're very happy with their provision of patent. Now, it doesn't mean also, it doesn't mean that it's not appropriate ever to ask somebody to sign NDAs. I'm not saying that. I'm saying for the most part up front, it makes it very difficult for them just to see your product. And most of the time they won't see it and they won't agree to it. And they just won't deal with signing your NDA. So if you do, your, if you get your provisional, you just send it on in. You know, you, you put patent pending on your cell sheet or your video, what have you. And you take care of that. But now let's say they show a lot of interest. They saw your sell sheet. Now with some products, they fully get what your product is in, in, in all its entirety just by looking at your marketing materials. Other times there's things that are hidden that they don't understand. And maybe they want you to send them a prototype or send them CAD drawings or send them something. So now they know what your product is. Now they're interested. So you're not one in 150 people submitting to them every month. You're the three that they showed interest in. So asking them to sign your NDA at that point sometimes is acceptable because it, it, it definitely. So I'm not saying never ask somebody to sign an NDA, but if you ask them all to sign it up front because your attorney thought that was a good idea, ask your attorney how many products they have license. Probably zero um, because it's not very practical. Um, now, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying it's not very practical and it will be very difficult to get into companies if you ask them all to sign your NDA. Um, so got a few minutes left here. Uh, so many questions about Pat, so boring. Um, but they're good. I know you guys are concerned about it. I just like the other stuff better. Um, oh, Brad says, I think it's just a compliment. I guess I'll read it. Make me feel good about myself, right? <laughs> You're so focused and straight up and high performance on this YouTube deal, other roles you play are, are teamed in sharing engagement. This is where your value um, and rimshot humor shines. Thank you, Brad, I appreciate that. Um, I am a, a very information and, I mean, I was our first coach. So we have 10 coaches and a negotiation coach now. We've had students in 65 countries, but I was our original OG or whatever you want to call it. I was our original coach original vampire, original whatever, you know? I don't know, I was watching this vampire show with my wife the other day, and it's like, it's, it's, like, it's kind of embarrassing to say that, but it's called The Originals, and it's like, um, uh, there was the original vampires, right? And so I feel like, in part, I, I made our coaches, I set up the way we train our coaches. Now Terry, our head coach, trains them. I'm very proud of the, the great people we have working for us. Um, but I'm very information-oriented, and, um, Action oriented. I always want to provide value, so that means a lot to me, Brad. Thank you. Um, let's see.
Gabriel, uh, hello, Andrew. I remember you did product evaluations for like two years ago. Will you be doing product evaluations again sometime in the near future? I think there was a time where I, I did it for free and it was crazy, guys. I did them like all day long for like two weeks. Um, what, what I'll say is that it's really hard to provide a proper evaluation. Our coaches do that. You have to get deep into it. And it's like, well, you need to go find this info and then come back. And then let's like evaluate this thing together. Um, can you do surface evaluations? You know, yeah, absolutely. And so if um, I can, let me see. If you guys want to book with me, I can find my link here. Um, so this is the link. This, I don't normally give people this link. Um, and I'm not saying I'm going to do evaluations for everybody, but this is a link to my personal calendar that opens up huge amounts of time. Um, normally when people are interested in the program, they talk to Sylvia or Eli, but I talk to a percentage of people as well. Um, if, 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 if you guys are interested in the program and you want a five minute um, evaluation, you can book a call with me there and I'd be happy to give it to you. All I ask is you're as articulate as possible in what the product is. If you have a picture of an existing product and say, well, it's like this, and you find it on Google Images, but I changed this. Um, because normally it takes like 15 minutes just to figure out what the product is. When, so if you can be really articulate, I'll, I'll do that for a few of you. I'll, I'll definitely do that. Um, but, uh, but in, you know, you need to get in depth, you know, but sometimes I, I sometimes it's easy. Sometimes like, well, I really need to look up this information to figure it out. Um, yeah. So Adam says, hi, Andrew, when you get a marketing person on the phone, do you try to keep the call somewhat short? Just ask them if they accept ideas and if you could email them. Yeah, that's all you're doing, guys. Hi, my name is Andrew Krause. I'm with Andrew Krause Designs. We design and license new products, and I have a new uh, gardening trail that I think would fit in uh, good with your product line. Can I email you a sell sheet? Um, that's it. You know, and that's so you're just trying to, and sometimes the gatekeeper will give you an email address. Be very brief and to the point, um, because if you start getting into a verbal explanation of it, explaining your product over the phone is like trying to explain how to tie your shoelaces over the phone. It's a bad idea. It really is. Now, occasionally, some of our students are like, oh, they're like, send it to me now. Well, I'll stay on the line. You can send it to me. That's pretty rare. And I wouldn't say it's a good idea to do that because it's kind of wasting their time. If you're just going to email it to them and follow up, you establish a relationship. They appreciate you didn't take a bunch of their time. I would not do that most of the time. But you can. Um, you can just, okay. But, you know, if it takes you 10 minutes just to get the email together, you know, and then, and then they look at it. You know, you can hear them thinking, so that would be beneficial. But you're just mostly asking permission to, to, to email it. And then another thing that I'll say is, um, we're running out of time here, guys, but you, sometimes our students, they'll make connection with the person on the phone, and you'll feel really good about it. Oh, they were so nice. And they said, yes, yeah, send on over. And then you send it, and it's like crickets. But you realize they're very busy. So don't be offended if you need to follow up two or three times and when you do, always send all the same stuff. Did you get my email? Did you see it? It's like, then they need to search their email for your email address. Use some common sense. Send all the same stuff again. And don't be offended. They're just very busy. We're all very busy. We're all very inundated. Do you look at every email you guys get? Probably not. I mean, a lot of it's spam. A lot of it's junk. You're just overwhelmed with your day-to-day -day stuff. Just realize that's the same for them as well. And don't think like, oh, they're uh, – they're just, they're, I, I thought they were nice, but they're asses. They're not replying to me within a day. Don't do that, guys. That's not professional. So be patient. And another piece of advice I'll give you is keep yourself busy. So, you, yeah, you got excited. They said send it to me. Don't focus on that. Set your follow-up dates and set your follow-up emails or phone call or whatever it is. Keep yourself busy with approaching other companies. That's the best way to not drive yourself crazy. Keep yourself busy doing other things to get this deal done, to approach other companies, to follow up with other companies. And then you just, you just make it part of your weekly routine. And do more, more doing, less thinking. You, know, you can think about it. You can make up in your head that this, this is it. This is it. I know that it sounded enthusiastic. 
you don't know. Deals fall out all the time. So keep a lot of irons in the fire. Um, so Vic says, send me your number. I want to do a licensing deal. Um, well, I'll put our phone number here. This is our main number right there. So if you call the main number and say, I was on a YouTube live with Andrew, um, you know, uh, then, you know, they can get you booked with me. You can also just use that link I just put there and, and schedule an appointment with me. Um, but, but just realize the, the, if I do a call with you, it's not like one-on-one -on -one coaching. I mean, we charge for that. I can talk to you about the program. I can take a quick look at your product. I'd be happy to do that. Be happy to sign an NDA as well. Um, so if you sign up on there, then drop an email to Andrew and invent, right? Say, can I have an NDA of meeting with Andrew? And he said, I was going to look at my product. Um, I'm going to answer this last one because I really like this question from Craig. How many companies should I show my idea to within a day, week, month? Like, should I submit the idea to all of them? Or is, or is there an about number? As many as you can. I mean, if you if you want to spend an hour at a time reaching out on LinkedIn, reaching out on the phone, reaching out via email, great. If you want to spend five hours doing that, great. But it's you know what I like is consistency over um, being psycho on one particular day. I it's got to be part of your weekly routine. So if you spend two hours submitting to companies every Monday or every Tuesday, great. I would prefer that than you spending five hours once and then not following up and not doing a good job. So, um, you know, it's, it's, you can never reach out to enough, but don't, if you just sent it to them yesterday, don't follow up again the next day. That's not appropriate. So there it's as much as you can do, Craig. Um, but the best thing that I can say is our students that are successful are the ones that are consistent um, consistently persistent and making it part of your weekly routine. Um, because most of inventing and licensing is not about your idea. I always like to say that to shock people. It's about the routine of reaching out to companies, getting your sell sheet done, getting your list done, following up, following through, and just the, the, the drudgery of getting it out there. And people are freaking, I'm going to say it, people are lazy about that. It's very rare that I see an inventor that's not a MetRight student that push as hard as they should be pushing. So whatever you're doing, um, Craig, you can probably be doing more. But don't put so much stress on yourself that you're like, well, I'm busy, Andrew, I got a job and I got this or that. You know, it's okay. Set aside the time. Do two, three, four, five, six hours a week, whatever you commit and be consistent and don't beat yourself up if things don't happen overnight. And don't talk to one company and go, oh, well, that's how it always is. Don't make assumptions. That's the nice thing about having a coach. You share something with your coach and coach is like, wow, that's just really weird. I don't see that happen often. Or your coach says, that's going to happen to you all the freaking time. Here's how you're going to handle it. So when you don't know what normal is, it's you, you make assumptions based on a very small sampling of experience and you jump to conclusions. So the other tip to get make a long story short is don't jump to conclusions. You experience once one or two things that you think it's always like that. People do that a lot. That's a big mistake that I see our invent right students, non-invent right students making. Um, and not all of you are going to become invent right students. I understand that. So I really enjoy giving these tips to you when you guys are doing it on your own. Um, and, and encourage you to do that. So uh, thank you, William, for telling me, uh, for the, the compliments. Um, oh, Michael is asking, what about the academy? So we do have another program that's group coaching. And instead of the 3,000, you can pay it over six months for the boot camp. it's $900 and it's the academy. And it's Tuesdays and Thursdays for a whole hour. And, but it's in a group. So there are like 15, 18 other people there. So you can't publicly disclose your invention, but you can ask questions like, hey, this company said this, which they say back. It's, we can't, you know, it's, it's more limited. Um, usually the people that are in there are on a very limited uh, budget. Um, it's more limited than the boot camp, which is one-on-one -on -one where you can say anything to your coach because it's just you and your coach. But it does offer you more help than this or more help than watching a YouTube show or reading a book um, because you're in there watching the training videos 
and you're also talking to um, some really, we were seen, some of our senior coaches in there that do the trainings for the academy. And that program is only 900 bucks. It's very affordable. And I'm glad we're able to service people at, at a lower price point as well. Um, they don't have as much success as the boot camp because you're not getting one-on-one -on -one help. And you have to be more motivated with the academy because you're kind of on your own. Nobody's like with the boot camp, we're calling your ass if you disappear on us. Like the coach is calling you, they're emailing, where are you? What are you doing? You know, and sometimes students say, oh, I don't want to bother you because I didn't get anything done this week. And coach is like, that's exactly why you should have booked an appointment. So we're not doing that with the academy because it's a lower price point in the group. So um, thank you, Peter, for saying I'm inspiring and coaching you guys tonight. Um, I, I just love doing these. You guys can tell I love answering questions. I hope you guys enjoyed it, regardless of whether or not you become an event rights student one day. Um, we feel like we have a very strong in, in our community. I think we're coming close to um, 40,000 subscribers. And we did that the slow way for, and for a, a niche thing like licensing your inventions, that's a pretty big audience. And we're, we're getting close to 40,000 subscribers. So I'd like you guys all to um, celebrate that with us. And if you're not subscribed down below, um, I think when we're doing the live stream, you can still subscribe. Um, please click subscribe. Um, let's let's get those numbers bumped up. I, I know a lot of you. I watch a lot. I'm a fan of a lot of shows where I don't subscribe. I started subscribing. It really is a shot in the arm to the YouTube um, uh, expert, whatever you want to call us. Uh, when you see those subscribers go up, and you don't have to do anything with it. You know, it's not. I don't think we send you YouTube sends you spam or anything. So if you guys could subscribe, that would help us out. We want to hit that forty thousand level. Um, want to remind everybody to take care. Keep inventing, and we'll see you later. See you guys. Bye.